Okay, um, can you hear me? Right, Edward, just before you start, I'd just like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Gerald Dawson. I own the Wickham Gallery. I'm delighted that we're hosting this Zoom virtual show with Edward's wonderful work. Um, it was something that really came out of the blue uh, in January this year with little um, thought before then. Since then, a lot of hard work has gone into it, as, as you will soon discover. And, of course, a lot of hard work by Edward in the preceding three years. And this is a compilation of work over... Uh, a period of time. Um, I think it's remarkable work. Um, I've never given a, a one-man show to an artist whose work I've never shown in my life before. So that in itself stands testament to what I believe is extraordinary uh, capability and, and really wonderful, wonderful pieces. Um, thank you very much, Need. I shall, I shall really be qu as quickly, quick as possible to allow an, a, enough time for people to ask questions. First of all, I'd like to just very, very briefly talk about watercolour, which I think is a magical medium. It is incredibly versatile. It is tricky. One needs to understand it. But in my view, you need to go with flow. In other words, you don't need to fight it. You need to enjoy it. And I have actually spent the last sort of 30 years just doing countless, countless experiments just to see what happens with watercolour, which I've sort of filed these experiments and I, I, I refer to the whole time. And, and it gives one the freedom, these experiments give one the freedom to really uh, relax and just enjoy the watercolour. Um, and really to sort of build up an empathy between yourself and, and the medium. People talk about mistakes with, with watercolour. Uh, the great uh, watercolourist, um, Scottish watercolourist, um, Arthur Melville said that the mistake was the beginning of the painting. In other words, if you make a mistake, then that is the start when you, there is a tension between you, the artist, and, and the paper. Um, so that's sort of watercolour, very, very briefly. And then the next thing I'd like to briefly say is why I'm painting. I, I feel, I, I was very struck by, like everybody else, by the, the power of the war, war artists' work from the First and Second World War. And of course, you know, specifically one can think about um, Paul Nash and his extraordinary paintings of, 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 of the First World War. And I felt there was a certain responsibility to me as a landscape architect and a, and a painter to also to, to paint with a purpose. So I gave my, I, I appointed myself as a sort of a war artist for the landscape. And I wanted to paint uh, issues which are important, um, but not to make dystopian images, but to make paintings which hopefully were arresting and would make people um, talk about the issues behind them. Um, and they essentially, they are really conversation pieces. So the first section is, wildflowers. Um, we basically, these wildflower paintings um, were done in Greece. Uh, and they are, as everybody has told us, that the wildflowers in Greece in, in the springtime are amazing. Of course, that's due, due to the geology, the limestone, but also to the fact that there are very little chemicals or no chemicals have been used at all. One realises that that is actually what England was like. Um, in the 1950s and 40s and early 70s, etc., when we had a sort of chemical-free land. And these paintings are an attempt to, to portray the sort of spirit of being within the wildflowers and the sense of the noise of the insects and the bees. And, and I was particularly interested in these, with, which when you look at the wildflowers, it's the spaces between the stalks uh, of the uh, of the, the of the sorry the spaces between the stalks, which add to the richness of visually to to, to, to what you're looking at. In other words, it's not just the um, the, 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 the wildflowers themselves. And even then, I was trying to imagine what it'd be like to be an insect, being within this world, being sort of bamboozled by all these wonderful um, sights and smells for you to um, <coughs> pollinate or not, as the case may may be. And there is a sense that, that the it's like sort of, in some respects, like being paradise. 
that it's so so sublime the smells and the noise of the um the insects and one can understand why people believe that your soul in, in, when when you die your soul departs and may well come back um as a as a wild flower um and the fact that the, the Greek civilization was so powerful makes one think, well, maybe this is why the, the, the wildflowers in Greece are so prolific. Um, there's also something which is very interesting is that the concept of music and plants, that the Americans have done research using orchestral music um, to, as fertilizer. And they have proved over three weeks period that actually the the um sorry the 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 the, the uh, vitamin c content of oranges can increase as much as 30 percent with with sound and there is a belief that the dawn chorus and and the in the noise of insects is all the symbiotic symbiotic relationship between plants and animals and I, and this is in, within this these paintings i'm trying to sort of hint at at, at these these ideas So this section is to do with the landscape and just sort of really trying to um, read the uh, read the sort of spirit of the landscape. That if one sits down and looks at a landscape, um, one can make up stories about you know why, why it is as it is. That the, this uh, these are in Sicily, and the landscape in Sicily seems to be so prevalent or, or, or of the mafia. Um, it's in, in, in my opinion, it's quite a sort of brooding landscape, and these this sort of division of um, the fields into these rather crazy patterns it seems to be. And it, this is just my imagination; I may be completely wrong, but it, it it seems to indicate a sort of land ownership of brothers who fought brothers who had the land divided by their father, and one was given a big plot, one was given a small plot, etc., etc., etc. And there is. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason of, of why these shapes should be as, as they are. Um, and also just looking at, th this is um, in um, East Sussex, looking at the, 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 the English la landscape, the colours, which if you look really hard, the colours in the landscape are often really strong. And in a way, these, these paintings, although they are, semi-abstract perhaps uh, maybe I'm trying to um, put across the, the spirit of the landscape as opposed to necessarily it being completely and utterly um, realistic uh, on the right hand side um, th these are um, images of uh, nine elms in, in London and uh, just by the uh, American embassy and I was interested by the, the change of a city as new things get built so the, 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 the city gives over its past history to the new history. And there is a point with all the site huts and, and the scaffolding and goodness says what, which neither the new is in prevalent nor is, is the, the past. And there is this sort of moment which may last for maybe a year or so when neither is stronger. And actually building, building anywhere, but building in a city is a very violent um, uh, process. And... Um, one feels that the city doesn't like giving up its, its past too, too easily. Um, then this next section is the sort of magical quality of light, which you see in, 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 in trees, sunlight, sorry, caught in, in, in trees, of which the Japanese got this expression, kamarobi, um, and there's nothing sort of translatable in, in the English language. But to me... It, looking at the, these the paintings were taken from light in Richmond Park. Um, and I'll show you some paintings which I did on the site. But to me, the, the medieval man who didn't have sort of digital photography or digital images, etc. I mean, the, this must have been, as with in stained glass within cathedrals, this must have been, you know, the most brilliant sort of light shows that he would ever experience for us you know when you go to the illuminations of, uh, of Piccadilly Circus or whatever um, they are sort of super super real but sort of 400 years ago th these light qualities would have been perhaps uh, stronger in relationship to what other people had, had seen and certainly during 
lockdown, you know, one's sort of craving to be outside in, in, in seeing nature, they, they become very special. And, and this, this, this is uh, <clears throat> trying to portray uh, light through trees. And it, and it shows basically these very, very, very thin washes. Some up to about 12 washes, nothing really much happens. The, the, the watercolours tend to look rather dull if you use very thin washes. If you, could, if you look in the middle, you can see there. That, that's the, the, the density of the wash of everything else. So it's very, very thin. And after about 12 washes, you then start to get these sort of beautiful, well, my humble opinion, these beautiful sort of uh, qualities. Um, because basically one, one wash isn't a thug, which is squashed other washes in, in the process. And I, I particularly love the translucency of watercolours, and you can get you get this feeling of depth. Um, so these these are these quick sketches which I did on Richmond in Richmond Park, giving trying to get the quality of light, and because they were fast, they have a certain sort of direct energy to them. The, the next section is soil. There's a the, the, the agrochemical industries and soil is this huge power, power behind um, agriculture, and obviously the agrochemical industries, who basically financed a lot of the agricultural courses, both in, in America and in the UK. The significance of that is obviously they want to promote chemicals, but this does terrible things to the, or can do terrible things to the, the microbes and the soil health. And um, I went to, I went to a conference on soil about two years ago. And then from that conference went to, there's only two laboratories in the, in Europe where you, they, they study um, microbes and soil to advise farmers. And then this sketch on the left-hand side was done well, one eye was on the microscope and the other eye I was um, drawing. And it was just really exciting to see amoeba because at school when you, you learned about amoeba and they look, you know, they look all right. But actually to see an amoeba for real under a microscope and it's sort of pulsing was, was extraordinarily exciting. And then seeing all this bacteria ru rushing around the place, when I felt very humble because it's it's sort of world which, as Leonardo da Vinci said, we know more about the skies than than we do in, in the, the, the than the soil underneath us. And of course, you know, soil is uh, the, the health of the soil is so incredibly important. So these these paintings were done from I had read several books on soil. So these early ones were my imagination of the, the life within soil. And I was trying to portray the sort of energy and um, the different qualities. And then having gone to this laboratory um, and influenced by looking at amoeba, I realized that it was actually a much more dynamic or could be seen as a much more dynamic um, world that I had previously considered. And um, so these, these watercolors are trying to show the spirit of what it's like to be an amoeba. And, and of course, in a handful of soil, um, there's more microbes than there are human beings on the planet. You know, it's an extraordinary um, data. Um, and, but I think there's, what, what, what is helpful is there's a certain empathy between um, watercolour and, and um, microbes. Then this section is on abstract paintings. In, in some ways, they are not really abstract at all. They're extremely concrete, as Charles Biederman would say, because they are what they are. And, and watercolour has um, you know, the, the, the flexibility and the, the life of watercolour is terrific for, for making abstract paintings, in my opinion. Um, and these, the one on the right, for example, um, is there are about... 18 washes to build up to give this sort of very, very rich sort of rusty colour. And, and what I particularly love is the way that the washes um, fizzle, dry out on the edges, but one has to be really, really, really careful to get beautiful edges rather than nasty edges. Um, and, and of course, light and white is, is, is absolutely crucial with watercolour. Watercolour relies on light hitting the, the paper and then coming through all the various washes which are layered on top of it. And therefore, 
it, it is the most wonderful media to um, portray light, hence all these marvelous uh, watercolors of, of, of Venice, of course. And then this shows sort of the, the ability of the luminosity, what one can achieve by watercolor, and especially by having things, as it were, fuzzy and slightly out of focus, gives that one's mind sort of sort of penetrates the um, the paper more, more perhaps. These are Epping Forest. <clears throat> Epping Forest is northeast of London. It's a ex- wonderful area. It's about f- over five thousand acres. Um, it was never uh, uh, um, sorry. It was never turned over to al- agriculture because the ground was so too poor and it was very gravelly. So for a very very long time, it, it was just a hunting forest till Queen Victoria in 1867 made it a public space. But as um, when it was a hunting forest, um, commoners were allowed to come in and coppice the timber um, for fuel and etc. And so that what, what you get when you go to Epping Forest is this extraordinary, um, it's like a sort of going to a th- three dimensional um, art, uh, sculptural, installation because you get these trees which go up sort of vertically for about uh, 15 foot and then the branches do all these extraordinary things because they've allowed they haven't been managed they've just done what they want to do Um, but the ground is this extraordinary Orange, sorry, back there. The, 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 the ground is extraordinary orange because it's the leaves, the beech leaves, which have gone onto the ground. And because of the gravel, they haven't rotted down and they've remained this terrific orange colour. And, and the quality of light is, is also very strange, actually. It's, we, <coughs> having been in the south of France, the, the Mediterranean light is something which one rem- it's hard not to remark on. Epping Forest has a very, very um, beautiful light, and it seems to be sort of very redolent of um, old foresters, and, and you, you feel there's a lot of sort of ghosts there. I mean, good ghosts, but it's the, the presence of the past is very, very evident. And and I found it, it, was, it the spirit of the place is is extraordinary and it's very because it's just outside London it's of course inevitably very very popular. And then finally, um, these are um, <coughs> studies of some very, very old veteran oak trees in Richmond Park. I was lucky enough to have a meeting with the um, chief arboriculturalist for uh, London Parks and the um, park manager of Richmond Park to really look at these very, very old oak trees. And what, what, what they have are the, 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 the timber, basic of these 750-year-old trees, really portrays um, the life of the tree. And the, since the xylem and phloem is of taking um, nutrients and water up and up, up into the canopy and down back to the roots, they are, they basically, it, they are, so there are map, maps of energy, maps of energy over 750 years. And therefore, it seems to me that you're looking at something which is a, a sort of like a signaling system, that although the, the tree doesn't have an intelligence, it obviously has a, <coughs> a, a communication system. So, you know, why should one branch go out there? And, and I think, you know, when you look at a knot, and why does that branch go out there? And what happened to that branch? Was it used as firewood or, or did, was it, did it become part of a, 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 an oak galleon or, or did it end up as a chair? And, and it's when you look at these um, trees very carefully, you, you feel you can enter into another world. And... That, ladies and gentlemen, is that. And then this is Gerald Dodson's gallery in Stockbridge with these paintings. And that sort of gives you an idea of the scale of them. That's all. Thank you.